Welcome to the MTA Podcast Series, a weekly audio cast featuring interviews with recognized industry professionals, and your host, Ed Carlson. Today, December 8th, 2009, everyone times the market. Some people buy when they have money and sell when they need money. Others use methods that are more sophisticated. Today's guest is Tom McClellan, editor of the McClellan Market Report and standard bearer of the McClellan Oscillator. Tom McClellan is the son of Sherman and Marion McClellan, co-founders of the McClellan Oscillator. Tom is a graduate of the U.S. Military Academy at West Point, where he studied aerospace engineering, served as an Army helicopter pilot for 11 years, and began his study of technical analysis. In 1993, he left the Army to join his father, and in 1995, they launched their newsletter at the McClellan Market Report. Tom McClellan, welcome to the program. Good to be with you, Ed. Good. Well, good morning to you. Tom, today's podcast is going to be in memory of Sergeant Mark Renninger and officers Tina Griswold, Ronald Owens, and Greg Richards, all members of the Lakewood, Washington Police Department, and all gunned down on November 29th. Today, 20,000 mourners are expected to attend a memorial for these police officers at the Tacoma Dome. You live and work in Lakewood, Washington. Let's take just a moment out of our busy days to remember these people. And, and Tom, could you give us your impression of what's been going on in this Seattle-Tacoma suburb of Lakewood this last week as you and your fellow citizens prepare for today's memorial? Well, it's a, it was a real hard week, a real gut punch. Um, but most people have probably never heard of Lakewood, Washington, uh, where 65,000 people were a suburb of Tacoma. In fact, <clears throat> up until about 12 years ago, it wasn't even a city. It was an unincorporated area, and, and a bunch of people got together and decided that what we need to make our lives better is another layer of government, and so now we're a city. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, in response to that, I hate to interrupt you, but uh, you know how I found out about this? You say nobody's ever heard of Lakewood. Uh, my wife, who was born and raised in Fukuoka, Japan, told me about what happened here before I heard it on our national news. She got the news from a Japanese news website. So this is, this is an event uh, that has that is shocked not just uh, Lakewood or the C- Seattle-Tacoma area, but not even just nationally, but globally. It's just such a shocking uh, event for everyone. Well, but the really nice thing that's come out of it is that everybody uh, – recognizes this is something that should never have happened and it's awful and we all need to pull together for support and so i've driven past the lakewood police station um dropped off some pizzas there over one day just because they had a bunch of extra mouths to feed and, and uh there are police cars from every municipality around here there's probably 10 different uh, uh logos on the police cars that are there uh the federal way and tacoma and olympia and and other uh, other cities around here those officers are pulling the shift duty today for the memorial service for the so that the uh, the the police officers who would be on duty can attend the memorial service mm-hmm. and that's well, just the nice kind of thing that they that uh, is happening the the uh, local police guilds are hosting the uh, officers that are coming in from out of town uh, awesome. some hotels have donated rooms firefighters are coming in also for the memorial service and and uh, just nice to see everybody pulling together and and remembering that uh, this kind of stuff should never have happened yeah, that's right. That's right. All right. Well, let's, let's talk about something more fun. What's that? Let's talk about something more fun than that. Yes, indeed, indeed. And 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 you know what? Let's go right back to where we start. I started this podcast. Uh, I'm going to read this quote again. This is my all-time favorite quote in technical analysis. Everyone times the market. Some people buy when they have money and sell when they need money. Others use methods that are more sophisticated. Unfortunately, I can't give you credit for that, can I? That was my mother. Uh, who passed away in 2003, and uh, she was a math major, and she was part of the team uh, with my father that came up with the McClellan Oscillator. In fact, uh, without her, it probably wouldn't have gotten done because uh, they did this work in 1969, and if you can remember back that far, uh, there were no computers that anybody had access to in 1969, so all of the calculations of exponential moving average values were done on scratch paper, and all oh. the charts were plotted with a pencil and a ruler and graph paper, and that was how you did it back then. Good Lord. Well, Tom, if we're going to start at the beginning of your story, we, we really need uh, you to give us some more background on your parents. Tell, tell us, how did they become interested in the markets? What, what were they doing prior to their market timing work, and, and how did they make the transition to full-time analysts? 
Well, as, as I mentioned, my mother was a math major. She went to Pomona College, and back in the 50s, it wasn't quite really fashionable for women to be math majors, but she did it anyway. And she met my dad uh, at that time in college when he was attending next door's uh, Claremont Men's College, which is now Claremont McKenna. He was a business major and tried to learn business and economics and fundamentals and how the, how the world worked. And then he, when he tried to trade based on what he'd learned, he found that it doesn't work that way in real life. So he decided he needed to <laughs> go back and do some more learning about how life really works. At the same time, um, my, my grandparents owned an interest in a farm in Illinois, and they had my dad managing it. And, and what that means is that uh, there was a tenant farmer that was uh, growing corn there, and the deal was that the owners got half the crop. Well, you don't want to sell your corn crop in September when everybody else is coming to market with corn that's just been harvested because the price is really low. And right, so the right. game then was to store it in a corn crib, dry it out, and then when all the hog farmers who uh, feed their, that corn to their hogs are, are seeing their bins run low, then they go to the market and try to buy more corn to feed the hogs in you know February or March, and you can get a much higher price for it. But my dad didn't understand that, uh, just taken over. He didn't really understand the, the, the dynamics of the corn and hog feed market. So he wanted to understand how corn prices move better so he could do a better job of, of knowing when to pull the trigger and say, sell my corn. And so he got some charts of corn prices and started looking at them and trying to study how prices moved and what made them move. And that's what got him looking at charts. Fascinating. They, uh, well, they, they continued in... Uh, in the 60s, because in L.A. there was something unusual. There was a, a television station called KWHY that did business news on a, on a UHF broadcast and uh, pioneered a lot of the things that we take for granted now, such as the ticker that rolled in the bottom of the screen and looking at, at what they called looking at the boards of, of prices. And, and the boards back then were these big... Uh, Big, big displays with odometer-style wheels that would spin around and update prices on things, and uh -huh. and, uh, and so there was a, a program on that on that station hosted by a guy named Gene Morgan called Charting the Market, and he ran that show from the mid '60s until about 1995, and he did something great for a whole lot of people, which was to teach them that you could look at a chart of price movements and get information from it. We take that for granted now as, oh, sure, sure, of course you'd look at a chart. But back then it was really heresy. And, and uh, if you were a chartist, you better keep your chart book in the bottom desk drawer so nobody sees you looking at it. It was, it was worse than, than being a voodoo astrologer. Uh, uh -huh. Chartists were, were a bunch of uh, loony bin kind of people, and, and any self-respecting analyst would never, never descend to looking at charts to try to get answers. And we've come a long way since then. Mm -hmm. But so you know, they, they got interested in doing that, doing uh, the market and charting it that way. And, and one day Gene Morton said, uh, put out a note to his, his listening audience. He said, hey, if anybody's got an interesting indicator or something, give me a call. And uh, at that time, my parents were working on what became the McClellan Oscillator. And my dad was the only one who called Gene and said, hey, i got something you might like to see. And that uh, led to him coming on the air and introducing it to the world and writing a book, Patterns for Profit. And uh, the rest is... Uh, history that people can read on our website. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's nice. Listen, um, okay, so that brings us up, uh, hopefully, to current times. Well, actually, one last question. You, as you mentioned, your mother's passed away. Your father, uh, is, is he living in, in California now? He still lives in L.A., remarried, and he and I still work together. Even though we're in different parts of the country, the electrons fly back and forth very nicely, and so uh, I can live up here where the, the trees and the lakes and the bald eagles are, and he lives in L.A. where he's more comfortable. Uh, mm -hmm. And then t today when it's uh, finally now up to 20 degrees in Tacoma, uh, living in L.A. may not be the bad thing to do. <laughs> <laughs> how, how did you end up up here? Is it your connection with the military? Yeah, I was stationed at Fort Lewis, Washington as my first tour as a second lieutenant in, in the military and flew helicopters there and, and other places, but just fell in love with the area, and so we decided to come back here once the, the Army days were over. Sure, that sounds very familiar. Um, okay, so that that brings us up to current uh, current times. Um, you know, anyone who's read your newsletter knows that the McClellan Market Report is about a whole lot more than just the oscillator that bears your name. Share with us your general approach to the markets, if you would. Well, in in general, I'll I'll use anything that I can demonstrate works. I, I'll look at woolly caterpillars if I can figure out that it's going to correlate to the market and give me an edge. So I try to look at anything and everything and throw out the stuff that doesn't work. Uh, we know that market cycles are very important in terms of uh, explaining why the market moves up and down. They're tough to use in terms of predictability because of the vagaries of how they work. But if you can get your arms around that and, and employ some other things that, that tell you 
a different story, and maybe you can <clears throat> excuse me, maybe you can formulate a, a coherent picture out of all of it, then uh, that, that puts you on the right side of the market. We also like to, <clears throat> in addition to having an expectation of what's going to happen, we want to have a means of, of demonstrating to ourselves that that expectation is coming true or not coming true. So in other words, you, you go in with a plan, but you monitor and make sure the plan's unfolding, and if it's not, that's how you know when to get stopped out. Right, right. Now you use, or you said you'll use anything that works, and I'm glad you said that because there's one one item you wrote about recently in a report that that I was debating asking you about. I I, I didn't want to bring it out in, uh, in into too sharp a focus and make it seem like this was your only direction. So I guess I've made it clear it's not. But talk to us about the uh, the, the price of gold and the lunar cycle. I, I was fascinated. I'm always fascinated when somebody talks about this sort of thing. And once again, I know this isn't your prime primary uh, focus, but uh, um, uh, talk to us about that, would you? Well, I, I first looked at that so that I could demonstrate to myself that, it, that there was no relationship there. Uh, I'd heard <laughs> a whole lot of people poo-pooing uh, anything that involved non-standard uh, methods of analysis, uh, but most of them had never looked at it, so they were operating out of a, out of a state of bigotry. They were pre pre prejudging the situation, saying it cannot possibly work and therefore it doesn't work, and therefore you shouldn't look at it, and anybody who does is a fool. Well, you know, that's, that's the argument. And I thought, well, that's a lousy way to do it. Let me at least first look at it, then I can state from the position of authority that it doesn't work. Well, I t took a look at the lunar cycle in gold, and I was unsuccessful at proving that, it, that there's no relationship. So that's, uh -huh. a, and that's an intentional double negative. There, there, yeah. is, there does seem to be a correlation between the dates of full moons and turning points in gold. However... It's not something that, you, that is terribly useful because you don't know in advance what sort of turning point it's going to be. It could be a top or a bottom, and you don't know uh, unless you're watching the trend zooming upward and, and into it, then you can probably figure, well, it's more likely to be a top than a bottom if I'm zooming upward. Right. But it can also, be, it can also mark an acceleration point out of a sideways move or an uh, upward or downward. So it, it, while there's a relationship there, it's not a good enough one that makes it something that you can use as a tool, it's maybe nice to know about, but it's it's uh, not good enough to to put into a, a trading plan. Uh, well, it certainly seemed to work this last full moon, didn't it? Yeah, uh, hit the top just about dead on. Yeah, amazing, amazing. Well, you know, once again, you say you'll use anything that works, and, and you, you make it sound like you've got a very open mind to all sorts of new ideas. That certainly doesn't sound like an engineer, but you're an engineer by training, and I have no doubt that you bring that engineering background to your study of technical analysis. Um, you know, in past weeks, several of our guests have had artistic backgrounds and have made the case that that element in their lives has made important contributions to their work. Tell us how your background has contributed to your work. You know, that, that is the funny thing, is that you meet a technical analysis people from all over, and they all have different backgrounds. It's not all psychologists or all doctors or all economists. It's anybody and everybody. There's musicians and artists and, and and people who came to it after uh, a business background like my father. And as long as you can open your mind to seeing the evidence as it presents itself instead of making the evidence fit into a preordained notion of how it should work, then you can be successful as a technical analyst. I, uh, the nice thing about engineering and what drew me to it is that every equation has an equal sign and everything on the left side equals, equals what's on the right side. And you know, if the, if the lift exceeds the weight, then the airplane will fly. Uh, it's a it's a nice way to look at it. Technical analysis is not so neat. You have the weight of the evidence uh, that that can push the market around, but you can also have rogue events that will come along and and uh, and push things around. Um, I tend to operate from a more of a kinematic viewpoint of uh, the uh, what they, what we used to call the sum of the forces equation in physics. You know, if the sum of the forces is pushing on the market upward, then the market's going to go upward, and uh, and that kind of leads to, to, my, to my, my basic rule of, of the, that there's only two fundamentals that work when it comes to the overall market. You can forget dividend yield and earnings. You can just forget all of that. The, the two fundamentals that matter for the overall market is how much money is there and how much does that money want to be invested. And well, this past year, the Fed has been working on portion number one of that, creating a whole bunch of extra money. So w regardless of whether that money wanted to be invested or not, there was so much of it out there that it had to find a way into the market, and that's what lifted us up out of the March bottom. At some point, if the Fed decides to take some of that money back, then that equation will go in the opposite direction, and, and the only thing that would keep the market up is 
that that money, that dwindling money, still wanting to be invested. So you have to watch both of those equations. Yeah, yeah. Before we go, let's let's end on uh, one final topic that I know will be of great interest to uh, many people listening to this interview. Uh, let's talk about the business of technical analysis in general. You know, uh, technical analysts tend to look at uh, the market in, in alternating secular bear and bull markets. And most uh, TAs would agree, I think, that we're currently in a secular bear market. And this could go on for 18 to 20 years, at least 10 more years if you look at the uh, 2000 top as, as the beginning. Um, Ralph Akampora has described this as the golden age of technical analysis. What would you say to um, to those who are are looking to uh, either start or continue their careers in technical analyst uh, analysis? What, what what thoughts do you have on the business of technical a a analysis? That's that's a great question, and, and I actually posed that question at an MTA seminar one year. Uh, is technical analysis in a bull market or a bear market? And uh, I didn't get a, a warm response from the panelists because they didn't. It was an uncomfortable topic for them. Um, but uh, as much as I hate to do that, I'll have to quote from CNBC's host Jim Cramer and say there's always a bull market somewhere. And uh, as the major brokerage firms were laying off their technical analysis teams because uh, basically uh, I would say that the CFA world had taken over that that universe. It was a it was a terrible time to be a technical analysis on Wall Street and in Manhattan. But it's been a wonderful time to be a technical analyst somewhere else because as the provision of that information from the brokerage firms has dried up, the customers have still been wanting to consume that information in ever-increasing amounts, and so they're turning elsewhere. So a private guy like me who uh, sits and writes for himself, uh, it's been wonderful for me, and the world has, has been able to beat itself to my door because they can find out about me on the Internet. Uh, when we started our newsletter in 1995, uh, it was eight pages, just as it is now, and, and it was all printed and mailed. And so I'd have to take the originals down to the local copy shop, and 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 they would uh, get them run off and folded, and I'd come back, and I'd have the kids and the wife around the dining table stamping and labeling and stuffing envelopes and and getting it uh, mailed off, and it was it was a whole lot of work. My my kids can stamp the Christmas cards now faster than anybody else because they uh -huh. have all the apprenticeship and in, in, the, in the stamping skills that they acquired, but. Uh, yeah. And, and actually, we still have a few diehard subscribers from the old days who are still, they still want it printed and mailed to them because uh, they're in the running to be the last one to get a computer, I guess. But uh, being able to exchange information online is so much better. And really, that's what technical analysis is. It's information. When you look at a price chart, you're getting information about how prices have moved in the past and how the uh, holders of a stock have behaved. <clears throat> one of the things that people think that when they're when they're buying an individual stock, is they think they're forming a relationship with the company. And, and so they want to know everything they can about the company. They want to know what it does and what it earns, what its prospects are for the future. But there's a more important relationship you form when you buy a stock, and that is a relationship with all of the other people who own that stock. And those people can screw you. And they, they, could, they can sell for no good reason and push a share price down, even though the company is still doing great. So if you want to know how those people are behaving and what their temperament is, uh, they will tell you in the behavior of the stock price. That's why it's so useful to look at. And more and more people are realizing that now. So in a sense, it's a golden age for the independent technical analyst. If he can rise above the fray uh, and all the other people that are shouting about technical analysis now, if you can, can show demonstrated excellence, then people will find you. Mm -hmm. You'll lead a path to your door. Tom, it's been just wonderful having you join us today. We certainly appreciate it. Before we go, is there anything else you'd like to uh, mention? Well, if anybody wants to sign up for a free chart service that we have, as we call it our chart in focus, you can go to our website, which is mcoscillator.com. It's, like it's like a McNugget, except it's a Mick Oscillator. Or you can just Google Tom McClellan. You'll find us. Uh, sign us for the chart in focus. It uh, comes free to you every week by email. No strings attached. Uh, no email marketing. None of, none of the garbage. We won't sell your name. or, or uh, We don't sell our list to anybody. It's just a free service to try to expand our brand and make people more aware of the kinds of work that we do. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, thanks again. And that wraps up today's MTA podcast. From Seattle, I'm Ed Carlson. You can follow me at my new website, seattletechnicaladvisors.com, or contact me at ed at seattletechnicaladvisors.com. Send us your comments and suggestions. Let's keep our stops tight. Good day.